students work on a variety of projects ranging from Google's neural machine translation system um, to Tensor to Tensor, which is a, um, a toolkit for uh, using deep learning with TensorFlow, um, as well as most recently the universal transformer models, which adds, um, which augments um, the successful transformer architecture with recurrence. Um, so without further ado, um, step up. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Uh, can everyone? Can everyone hear me with, uh, with this mic? Can everyone hear me in the back? It's good? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Sebastian, for the, for the introduction. And um, yes, thank you everyone who went before me for the, for the great talks. Um, I think Richard did a really good job of explaining a lot of um, you know, the current trends of NLP and what he's working on in um, multitask learning. Uh, of course, he did a great job of grounding us and situating it within the African context. Um, I thought I would actually change uh, gears a little bit and try to give a very subjective view of my grounding of how we have come to be where we are today as a field um, specifically focusing on deep NLP um, through the historical developments. And what I want to do with that is I want to take a slightly more general look actually at the evolution of how we've come to be where we are. Instead of diving deeply into one topic, um, I think of it as, I think of a lot of research as really banging your head against the wall until you get some kind of little bit of insight or a little bulb goes off. And then from that point on, sometimes, you know, obviously there's a lot of iteration there, but that leads as inspiration, which then um, allows you to solve that specific problem that you're focusing on. So what I want to do is I want to take us back through a little bit of a timeline of where we started and what these bits and pieces were, if you were, that we now have available and that we basically just depend on in the toolbox of um, deep NLP. And let me see if I can... <laughs> Looks like my introduction was too long. I... Password one, two, three. Yes, yeah, so while we're waiting for that, um, the goal of my talk for today would be first to make you a little bit excited about where we are as a community, um, as an NLP community, and then make you sort of realize that we're really not where we are, and then think about how we got where we are, and then also think about how we may go on from here. So. I'd like to start this by just reminding us, at least for me, when I got interested in natural language processing, in machines that are able to understand language, the goal for me was always being able to get, reach a point where this would be a good example. So last week we went to the Maasai Mara and we were doing a safari there. And we were on our, we, for those of you who haven't done it yet, you're on these land cruisers and they drive you around. And so we just entered the park, we we're pretty excited, Sebastian was with me. And we enter the park and we see a rhino, far off in the distance, but we see a rhino. And our guide tells us that this is a pretty rare sight and we should consider ourselves very lucky for having spotted the rhino so quickly. And so we continue on the track and a second guide drives up and stops next to us and they talk to each other in Swahili. Now, I'm not going to pretend that I can speak Swahili, but he said something along the lines of Tuliona Kifaru Huko Nyuma. And I know if we have any Swahili speakers, <laughs> so apparently I, I pronounced that um, reasonably well, but I don't understand a single word of what I just said. But I turned to Sebastian, uh, but the next moment the, the second driver sped off. And from the context, I turned to Sebastian and I said, I bet he just told him about that rhino. And the guide heard us, he turned around and he's like, yep, told him where the rhino is. And that for me is, is, is sort of a goal of where we would like to be or where we would like to get with natural language understanding systems eventually. It's something, it's a system that can draw from the, the, the context of the situation, draw from common sense, draw from understanding of basic language syntax and all of these different rules and be able to infer meaning out of situations and interactions between humans in that way. Um, the spoiler alert is we are nowhere near that yet at the moment. But I do want to say, so I want to structure this in three parts. I want to say, where are we right now as a community? And I'll just focus on three tasks. And, you know, there are many tasks in the NL NLP um, community that are all important, as we've seen today. Um, Richard mentioned 10 of them. 
Um, I'll focus on language modeling, machine translation, and named entity recognition. Um, I want to focus on those and see you know, how far we've come, maybe just over the last few years, but what the general trend is. And hopefully that'll give us some, uh, make us feel good about the progress that we're making. And then I want to take a step back and I want to sort of weave this into a tapestry of the conceptual developments and the advances over the last 30 or so years that have allowed us to reach that point. And then I'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about what I think that are personally to me interesting um, future research topics. But the thing with research is so the organizers asked me to talk about this and talk about my own research and then structure it as you know, what would be good future topics to work on. The thing with research is every one of us, we're basically riding on a wave somewhere and we all have basically the goal of reaching the beach, but we don't really know where this wave is gonna break. And if someone tells you that they know the answer, it almost always, you should be doubtful of that. So what I'll do is I'll tell you about certain things that I'm just a little bit excited about at the moment, um, and then um, uh, just tie that back into to, um, the rest of the talk. So in terms of where we are, this is a graph that I took from um, the website Papers with Code. And this is a very cool resource um, where they basically track the um, uh, different uh, evaluations on different tasks from papers that make their code available and they show the, the, the evolution over time. So what this is tracking is it shows the progress in language modeling. And now language modeling is a very old field and it's, it has existed um, in terms of Engram language modeling for a very long time. This just shows our progress from June 2016 when we started having deep learning papers and most of them neural based uh, models with the code available. And on the left axis, we have test set perplexity, and I believe this is on the Penn Tree Bank. Um, and on, the, on the, the lower axis, it shows time. And so perplexity is essentially how confused your model is by the next word that it has to predict. So it gives you a sense of, if your model is, perple if the perplexity is 100, it says that the model really was confused between about 100 different possible words for predicting the correct next word. And the trend here is we started about 60 uh, three years ago, and right now we are in the mid-30s. So we have a very, very, very strong downward trend. To show you some of, a lot of you have heard of um, GPT-2, you've heard of some of these recent uh, generations. This is a quote, this is actually an extraction from a 2011 paper on multiplicative RNNs by Ilya Sutskover. Um, and I'm going to read this one, and then we're going to skip to a generation from uh, February this year. So the model was prompted with, the meaning of life is, and the model completed it with, the tradition of the ancient human reproduction is less favorable to the good boy for when to remove her bigger. So we can see there's, there's something in there. And I remember talking to Ilya at the time, and he tried to convince me that you know, this, is, this model has deep insight. But... <laughs> It's, I think that you know, there's something in there, but there's also some sort of um, pretty easy to fix mistakes for, for a human. Fast forward, um, what do we have, eight, nine years to um, Radford and Wu published this in 2019. This is from OpenAI's GPT-2. Now, uh, how many of you have seen this generation before? I don't need to read through the whole thing. But you see that they have a much longer prompt for the model here. Uh, in a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley, da 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 And then the model completes this by making up this fictitious group of people who are living there, starting to generate um, the scientist who named the population, was named after the distinctive horn over its unicorn, generates a whole bunch of plausible sounding text in between and finishes it off by saying, Perez and his friends were astonished to see the unicorn herd. These creatures could be seen from the air without having to move too much to see them. They were so close they could touch their horns. All very reasonable sounding gibberish, but good, uh, well-formulated text. If we look at machine translation, we see the same kind of trend. Um, starting in about June 2016, machine translation we measure in terms of blue, which is sort of roughly an n-gram overlap between what your model produces and what the reference text is. We see these distinct jumps, but a general upwards trend. And these jumps all correlate to what I've highlighted in red at the bottom. These what I would like to refer to as conceptual advances. The introduction of attention, the GNMT model, which took an encoder-decoder architecture and took LSTM, put them all together in a, 
uh, a huge training setting where we were able to train over a lot of text. And then finally the transformer, which a lot of us have heard about. These conceptual advances every time correlated with one of these step changes in the accuracy. And finally, name entity recognition has the same trend. So the, if we look at the general trend of what we're measuring in NLP, we should be happy. We are improving, our models are improving, and this leads to actual benefits to our end users. We end up having better, we're able to build better um, web search engines. We're able to build phone interfaces where you can say, okay, Google, and the model actually understands you. You can ask a question, it can return results. But we do know that we're nowhere yet to that final end point of natural language understanding that, that I, a lot of us are hoping for. So how did we actually get here? And this is where I want to take you through a little bit of my subjective view over the last few years of some of the um, breakthroughs, ideas, and tools in our toolbox. Deep learning at a, I think all of us agree that most of our recent advances were as a result of what can be called the deep learning revolution or the result of end-to-end -end gradient based training where we were able to take ideas from neural networks and apply them to language modeling, machine translation. But deep learning at a, at a sort of a high level relies on um, having enough data and having enough computational power. And where we are today is very different to, to where we were 10 years ago and where we were 20 years ago. We're in this very fortunate position where we have access to very rich, large data sources. We have frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch. We have a lot of code available. We have TPUs, we have GPUs, um, and you, know, you have cloud opportunities for training your models in the cloud. All of these things have, at a sort of a high level, are contributing to the state of research at the moment. Not to mention the fact that we have a very open community. We share our research with each other. We share our code with each other. Zooming in, though, a lot of the advances of deep learning rely on these individual, um, what is the different nonlinearities that you're using, connectivity patterns, the architecture of your model, feed-forward, convolutional, recurrent, different kinds of optimizers, um, the loss function. So starting from sort of the canonical idea of deep learning, we're all familiar with this idea that of what I'm showing is sort of a uh, an um, animation of a standard feed-forward neural network. The goal is to take an image and predict whether it's a cat or whether it's a dog. So we take our image, we flatten it into one long vector, we give it as input to the model, the model processes this image through multiple stages, and finally at the end we train it with the right label, we generate an error signal, and we propagate this all back. Why does this not work for language? It doesn't work for language because language an image you can always put in the same sort of dimensional vector. You can use a 256 by 256 image or something like that. Language, not so much. Language is a sequence. So we, part of the, the, the advances were the result of developing models that actually um, work much better with sequences. And if you actually take a step back, most of the data that we have access to can be viewed as sequences. So for instance, the string, why sequences can be, um, uh, tokenized into the two words, why sequences. If we look at the word why, we can break it up into characters. If we look at that image, that's a sequence of pixels. If we say the word W, that will be a sequence of phonemes. So at some level, all of data is actually, uh, has a sequential form. The trouble with that is, when you're processing sequences, your model needs to be able to carry information from one end in the sequence to another end in the sequence. And to illustrate that very concretely, I'm showing here, uh, again, a language modeling example where the goal is I'm giving you a lot of text and you need to predict the next word. And the, what I'm trying to illustrate is the importance of modeling long-term dependencies because in this piece of text, the text starts out by saying Michel C was born in Paris, France. It then has a lot of intermediate confounding factors where they may talk about Germany or this or that, and in the end they say, his mother tongue is, you need to dis disambiguation of who his is, needs to refer back to Michel, but also you need to refer all the way back to the beginning where they said that he is from, from, from Paris to know that the most likely next word is France. And that's a very difficult thing to do, to model and actually make use of information across such long-term um, spans. So this is 
what I would like to view as the toolbox of deep learning. These are the kind, different kinds of um, tools that have taken us from the 80s to where we are today. And I'm going to just take a quick run through these, starting with our good old trained backpropagation in the 80s. Before this time, we weren't able to train deep neural networks. Backpropagation was an algorithm that was developed because of two conceptual insights. If you try to naively compute the gradients of a deep feedforward network, it's an, it's an exponential algorithm because you keep recomputing things that you've computed before. But the key insight that um, a couple of different people who worked on backpropagation, but mostly attributed to Hinton and colleagues had, was a deep feedforward network is a succession of layers, which you, therefore you can see a network as a chain of functions. So we can use the chain rule from differential calculus to compute gradients of the intermediate terms. That's the first one. The second key insight was, since we have all of these intermediate terms reoccurring all the time, we can use dynamic programming to make this more computationally efficient. And those two things put together is backpropagation. And that's what allows us to train all of the models that we're training today. In the 90s, um, Jan LeCun and colleagues, they were working um, at Bell Labs, I believe, and they wanted to develop a system that could read the address on um, letters. And so they, instead of using standard, they wanted to use neural networks, but in a standard feedforward neural network, all of your pixels are connected to the next hidden layer. And they had an insight from vision that maybe that's not necessary. Maybe we can have filters which only looks at parts of the input and have the, that information propagated upwards through the network and then make a classification decision, which is roughly inspired by the brain. And this was the basis of convolutional neural networks. In the 90s, um, we had RNNs, recurrent neural networks, but recurrent neural networks were designed to process sequences, but they didn't work very well for the very reason, and I'll look at that in a, in a, in a few slides, this thing called vanishing gradient or exploding gradient. And so, the Alice, with uh, Schmidt Huber and his um, postdoc, Sepp Hochheiter, they had this simple insight whereby they added an error carousel to the, to the RNN. And it'll become a little bit clearer in a second. But the idea is that this simple insight allowed the model to carry the gradients back through time. And Schmidt Huber is sometimes attributed, I don't know if it's correct or, not, or incorrect, by saying that Google will soon be a big LSTM because of the effect that, that LSTMs have had on deep learning. Um, but to understand that, we can basically summarize that in a nutshell by thinking of an RNN either as a computational graph or as a function in its functional form. We have on the right hand side, the hidden state at time step t is a function of the hidden state at time step t minus one and the current input. So you, because of that relation, h at t is related to h at t minus one, the gradient at t minus one is proportional to some weight or some function of the gradient at t. If you unroll that backwards through time, you have this multiplication w of the gradient at the next step. And what happens when you multiply a number by some number smaller than one, over and over and over? We've all played that game on the calculator. It goes to zero. That's called vanishing gradient. And what happens when you multiply a number by a number greater than one over and over and over? It explodes. And that's called exploding gradient. And so the key insight they had was to add another unit inside the recurrent cell, which has a derivative of one. So it maintains the gradient throughout every time step backwards. And that allowed us to train models that can process much longer sequences. In the 2000s, we started with word embeddings. We think of word embeddings now as no one even thinks about them twice. But back then, this was not, um, this was not a known thing. They were ideas of principal components based um, uh, embeddings, but these were not really used as features to do any kind of prediction. Uh, Joshua Benjo and colleagues, they uh, put out a paper around 99, 2001, and then again in 2003 called the Neural Probabilistic Language Model. And the key idea here was to map indices in your vocabulary to a vector through this one-hot multiplication that we've all seen, which, which projects your words into a continuous space and then just use a, use a standard feedforward neural network from that point on. So you have an n-gram based neural language model. Um, because these parameters are all part of the model, they optimize them during training, so they move these points around. And one of the side effects of this when they analyzed the word embeddings was they found that similar words ended up in the same space. And this was kind of an unexpected finding. No one thought about that geometrically up until that point. 
But that served as the basis for future work in NLP. And I'd also just mention that in 2000, they trained for three weeks using a cluster of 32 machines only on a, on, a, on a corpus of about 14 million words. And that was considered huge at the time. In 2010, uh, Colliber and Weston took this idea of training word embeddings much further. They optimized the loss function to use a hinge function, which is much faster to train than a softmax. They um, added a couple of other things and used this to train, pre-train large embeddings on large corpora of text. The key thing is they then use these pre-trained embeddings actually as the features to do part of speech tagging, chunking, and name entity recognition. And this is one of the first times where we saw that, that, that you can actually just use these pre-trained features and get reasonable accuracies on these tasks. This was the beginning of the, the whole word embedding craze in ACL proceedings. I'll skip this one because it's not uh, necessarily um, related, but in 2013, Tomasz Mikulov was working on, he had just finished his PhD work on um, RNN-based language models. And this idea of using word embeddings as features had just started coming out. So he looked at this problem and he really wanted to try to simplify it to its most, uh, to its simplest form. So he came up with the idea of the skip gram model, which I'm sure some people have heard of, and also CBAO, continuous bag of words. And the idea is pretty simple. As Richard explained earlier, you basically take a context of words and then you try to either predict the center word from the context, or you try to predict the context from the center word. And the first one is CBAO, and the other one is SkipGram. And you can do this over and over very computationally efficiently for large um, text corpora, and in the end, end up with your word embeddings. One of the interesting side effects that came out of this was, which was also mentioned earlier by Richard, is this idea of regularity in the embedding spaces. So they found that if you take the vector for king, and you subtract man, and you add the vector for woman, you end up roughly in the same space as um, the vector for queen. And this was very interesting, and it was completely unexpected, and prompted a lot of research in what other kinds of semantic features these embedding spaces um, capture. The obvious next step um, was, if we can do this for one language, can we do this for more than one language? This is actually the topic that I spent my PhD on. Uh, which at the time, in 2013, we had just started training reasonable embeddings in one language. And so we thought, well, maybe one thing that you can do is you can try to somehow align these embedding spaces. And it turns out it's actually pretty easy to do that. You can learn an affine transformation from one space to another. And what you get when you do that is you can do simple word-based translation by just looking at nearest neighbors. Or you can do transfer learning by training your name entity recognition model on English and then simply applying it to the aligned embeddings in um, French. So this got us word-based translation. The next step was how do we get from this to actual translation? I, I was around in a lot of the discussions around this. People were kind of convinced that we need some kind of autoencoder approach or, or some kind of encoder-decoder approach, but they weren't really sure how to do this. No one had yet, up until this point, um, tried to do autoencoders for languages where you have different lengths of words in the sequences. Obviously, you cannot use something like a feedforward net or a convnet for this. And so, a couple of different groups came up with this idea of trying to use an RNN, uh, in this case an LSTM, as an encoder, taking a sequence of words, mapping it into a vector, and then letting another encoder, RNN, look at that vector and decode the French from the English side. It turned out that it wasn't as easy as just doing that, but there was a simple trick um, that they discovered whereby if you reverse the source sentence, suddenly it becomes much easier. And so it worked, that was in Europe's paper. It wasn't state of the art necessarily, but, and they couldn't translate more than 15 words. It required one additional insight, which is this idea of attention in NLP. And so before this, we only used an RNN to encode an entire source sentence into one vector, and then a decoder only looks at that vector. The, quest, the insight here was, why don't we just let the decoder look at the entire source sentence? Let it attend to the entire source site while it's doing the decoding. And this ended up actually um, opening up a lot of um, uh, additional models and a lot of additional work. It was the missing ingredient to the point where at some point, if, there, if your problem could be cast in any way as sequence to sequence, this is probably what you'll use. This is a tweet from Isabel Augenstein at the time where she said, how do you choose which model to use? 
She said, can the task be formulated as sequence to sequence? If no, find something else to work on. If yes, do you have a big corpus? If uh, no, find something else to work on. If yes, do you have access to GPUs? If no, find a bigger grant. If yes, is the sequence length greater than 10? If it is, use attention. If it is not, use an LSTM without attention. And a lot of um, work actually ended up benefiting a lot from that uh, LSTM plus attention model. ResNets had the key idea of just adding skip connections. I'm not gonna go into the details because I'm kind of running out of time. But this ended up being a building block for a lot of the models that we see today. And a lot of our models actually consist, the sub-modules consist of having skip connections. Google's Neural Empty System took all of the, the ideas that we know of from before. They took an LSTM as an encoder, as a decoder. They took attention and basically just put this together and train on a lot of data. And this ended up really advancing the state of the art in machine learning, at, uh, machine translation at the time. Ended up um, closing the gap between the old system, which was replaced by this one, and human level translations between 58 and 70, uh, 87%. And this got us to 2017 which was the start of the transformer craze. Transformer was this entire model which was processing sequences without using RNNs, but using attention instead. And essentially, the, the, the development of that idea, as I recall, it started from the target side, actually. They wanted to do parallel decoding. So you want to decode the target sentence all at once. And Ashish was trying to get this to work for months on end, and we were talking about it, and he couldn't get it to work, and then at one point, we said, why don't you just try it on the encoder side? And so once you move that to the encoder side, you add a self-attention to that, you end up with a very computationally efficient model that you can train much faster on, on much more text. It ended up being a very successful model and it formed the basis for a lot of recent work, um, including GPT, the original model, OpenGPT, the second one, and BERT as well. In turn, I just want to quickly mention um, one or two things that I think um, are very interesting um, points to focus on currently in NLP. And I want to preface that by saying a lot of these recent models, a lot of these advances are big models that require a lot of computational power and a lot of data. And I think it's easy to fall in the trap of thinking that you cannot do meaningful work anymore if you don't have access to a lot of computational power. You don't have access to as much data as researchers at Google or researchers at DeepMind or FAIR or any of the other large companies. So I want to focus a little bit on sample efficiency and also on computational efficiency. Sample efficiency is this idea of how much does my model improve on the task with every additional example that I give it. And as this slide shows, which I actually took from Sebastian's um, NACL transfer learning uh, tutorial, thanks Sebastian, is it's, it's on a log scale at the bottom, and it shows us the accuracy on um, SNLI as well as semantic row labeling. The key takeaway here is that the main benefit we get is in the first 10% of the data that we feed the model. The additional 90% that we add adds single digit percentages, which are very important, but only single digit um, of additional performance. So it's pretty clear that, there, that we need to find ways of extracting more juice from the data in that final training regime in order to be able to reach the same levels of accuracy much quicker. At the same time, if we look at the size of our models, this is a, a graph that I got from um, the, that Twitter user. If we look at the size of our models from April 2018 through the to the, the current time, we see this, I'm not sure if you can see the, the, the curve, but it has this almost exponential slope where models keep getting bigger. But then if you look very closely, in the bottom there, there's a new model called the still BERT, where they trained a model almost half the size of the original BERT, but got to about 95% of the accuracy. And that to me is a very exciting line of research. How can we train more compact models using um, smaller data sets using less computational power but reach the same kind of levels of accuracy. This, I'm not sure how, who has seen this, uh, but there's an article in Tech Review where they actually reviewed the computational requirements for training state-of-the-art NLP models. And one of the main takeaways from this one is in order to train a state-of-the-art BERT model, which is in the middle there, it's the, it has the same carbon footprint of 1,438 as a round-trip transatlantic flight for an individual, for one person. 
And so I don't agree with everything in how they, they, they came to these estimations, estimates, but the point is definitely valid in that we should focus on developing more parsimonious models, more data efficient models, and models that require less computational power. And there are several ideas for that. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go through all of them, but I think if you're interested in this line of work, there's a very good article by Stephen Merity, who used to be at Salesforce, um, on specifically this topic. Um, I'll include the link, I'll leave the link up there on the slide. Um, but the ideas basically include reusing pre-trained models, um, use, reordering your data in a, into curricula where the model can um, learn faster uh, or better regularization. So just getting back to what I started with, um, with my talk, at the moment we have no models that are actually able to take a situation and a context like this and make that simple connection between what was spoken by the guide and what, uh, what the meaning of it was. But for us, it happens just like this. Despite all of that, we've had a lot of progress over the last several decades, which I think we should celebrate. But I think we should keep in mind that there's a lot of way to go for us and there's a lot of research that is needed. And hopefully, the bits and pieces that we may need will include some kind of training improvement, some kind of algorithmic improvement, some kind of tool in this toolbox, which I'm showing with a little question mark there, that will hopefully be contributed by one of you guys. Thank you.